Good morning everyone and welcome to our webinar in which we're going to discuss the new flexible working rules but we're also going to look at new legislation that's going to be coming in very soon that deals with predictable terms and conditions. So before we start we'd like to introduce ourselves. I'm Victoria Templeton, HR Knowledge Manager here at HR Solutions and I'm joined by Sue Watson who is our Operations Director and together we're going to take you through uh, the webinar this morning and we'll be taking your questions at the end. So just to um, clarify, clarify for everybody, you're going to receive a copy of the slides from today. They'll be sent out to you um, in the days after today's event and there'll also be a recording to make available to you um, afterwards or for you to share to your colleagues. And because we've got so many of you here today, which is great, we've placed you all on mute. But as usual, we do want to get your involvement um, in today's webinar. And so we'll be inviting you to ask us your questions. So on the screen now, you'll see an image of your GoToWebinar question panel. And you simply type in your question and then we'll aim to read out and answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. If this isn't possible, then we can follow up afterwards. So this is our plan for today. So we're going to first of all bring you up to date on the new rules for managing flexible working requests. We're going to then discuss the um, upcoming legislation where workers can request predictable terms and conditions. And we are then going to link these two pieces of legislation to how it can enhance candidate attraction and staff retention. And as I said, at the end, uh, we'll take your questions. So what are the new flexible working rules? Well, they've literally just come into force. And what they are is that from day one of employment, all employees can make a formal request for flexible working. The entire process now, including any appeal that is given, must be completed within a two month time frame. And an employee can now submit two requests in any 12 month rolling period, but only one can be live at any time, at any one time. And the regulations in the ACAS code of practice, they define that a request is live up until either a decision on the request or appeal is made, or the request or appeal is withdrawn, or an outcome is mutually agreed, or the two month time frame has expired. Employers are also now obliged to consult with an employee before declining a request. That's a statutory obligation. And just a reminder, the uh, statutory reasons for which an employer can decline a request, they remain the same. But just to summarise, that can be for either there's a burden of additional costs and inability to reorganise work amongst existing staff, or if there's an inability to recruit extra staff, or if it could have a detrimental impact either on quality or performance or the ability to meet customer demands. It can also be declined if there's insufficient work available for the periods that that employee proposes to work or where there's any planned structural changes to the employer's business. And do remember that the right is to ask and request. It's not an automatic right to have employers if they have those uh, strong business grounds as to why it won't work, they are entitled to decline a request. So I thought I would put this into context just to sort of illustrate how these new rules differ from before. So employees, employees no longer need to have that 26 week service to make a request. Um, so since day one, there's always had to be that qualifying criteria to be able to request flexible working. That has been abolished. And so effectively, all employees from day one of employment can ask. Now, it'll be interesting to see how um, this operates, uh, what the uptake is from employees with um, who fall in line with uh, this change. Um, but also, um, I am aware that other employees had already started offering that anyway before this legal change. So it's just an interesting and significant change to the rules. We also have seen um, the number of requests uh, that an employee can submit increase 
So now it is two. Previously, obviously, it was that one uh, request in a 12-month period. A significant piece from the application side of putting a request in is that employees don't need to explain how they think the impact uh, that the request may have on the business. That is no longer an obligation on the employee's part. And as I mentioned a moment ago, um, a significant change is around the statutory obligation to consult with the employee before declining, um, which I'll come on to a little bit um, in a moment. And then in terms of, um, from our perspective, what's changed, then we have updated our template policy forms, letters, all available on a knowledge base, and we'll soon to launch um, documents available via the doc shop. And of course, we've got an updated ACAS code of practice, which is critical if when you're managing flexible working. But what about the statutory obligation to consult before declining requests? What does that mean if you look at our fourth icon here? Well, we don't have any specifics in the regulations, uh, which is uh, normally the case, um, unfortunately, but we do have a guide in how we should interpret that obligation, and that guide is your ACAS code of practice. So, when you look at the ACAS Code of Practice, ACAS are suggesting that that consultation um, would entail um, several things. So, first of all, it can help to make sure that all relevant information is understood before a decision is made. The content of the meeting and how it's conducted should allow for that reasonable discussion and consideration of the request. Then it's usually um, helpful to, to discuss areas such as potential benefits, any impact of either accepting or rejecting the request, and any practical considerations for implementing it. If the request cannot be accepted in full, then it's about discussing any potential modifications that could be made to their original request, or if there are any actual suitable alternative options that may be available that could suit both parties. Another interesting aspect is um, perhaps uh, you may wish to consider whether a trial period may be appropriate to assess the feasibility of the request. There's not a statutory entitlement for a trial period and some cases are clearer than others as to whether um, it perhaps help in the process, but that these are all things to consider when um, consulting with the employee before there's a, a refusal of a request. And I guess it shows us of the greater need to be thorough in dealing with flexible working and really seek out if flexible working can be accommodated. So as opposed to sort of instantly thinking, oh no, it's not going to be um, workable for us, your starting point really needs to be, we can accept it, let's explore what the problems are. And then when you look at those challenges, if there are any, then that's what then um, allows you to move through your processes um, identifying if there is a, a reason why you shouldn't um, accept it. So we have new legislation coming into force later this year, it's called the Workers Predictable Terms Conditions to 2023 Act um, for, employ for workers and employees and agency staff. So if we think about workers and employees um, at this point only, we'll come on to agency workers shortly. But from a work and employee perspective, um, what we need to consider is um, how these rules apply. But just to give some context, back in 2017, there was a Taylor review into modern working practices. And that review found that many workers, whether they're on zero hour contracts, casual contracts, really struggled um, with flexibility from their employment. It was very much one-sided. And it found that that one-sided flexibility um, meant that workers would either have to be available to their employer, but there was no guaranteed work, or employers were able to schedule or cancel shifts with little notice. And so what it has ended up creating is um, an employment situation where um, individuals have insecure hours and insecure income. And so this Taylor review um, of modern working practices found that it needed, um, the UK needed to make improvements and changes to how um, workers are 
managed from a, a contractual point of view and to give that um, predictability. So it recommended introducing a right to request a direct contract of employment for agency workers who have been placed with the same hirer. It's also introduced a right for zero hour contract workers to request that more predictable contract after working for the employer for 12 months. So the public consultation has recently taken place on a new ACAS code of practice called the handling request for a predictable working pattern. What ACAS are doing now is analysing all of the results from that public consultation and then looking to see if there needs to be any amendments made to the draft code of practice before it gets published and before the regulations come into force. So in terms of commencement date, we are expecting it to be from around September, maybe October, but um, early um, later this year in sort of early autumn and um, as I said it will be to give workers with a statutory right to request more predictable terms conditions of work but where there is a lack of predictability so there is certain um, obligations or requirements or eligibility criteria if you like so the draft regulations define a work pattern um, as being either the number of hours that someone works the days of the week that they work or the times um, in which they work the hours on those days, or it could be for the period for which that worker is contracted to work for. To be eligible, the worker must have worked for the employer at least once in a month in the period before the 26 weeks leading up to the day of the request. Um, and then, interestingly, uh, fixed term contracts that are under 12 months in duration they're regarded under the regulations now as having a lack of predictability so it links into that um, a third bullet point there that I put where it's about the period for which you work it's contracted to work so fixed term contracts of uh, less than a 12 month in duration will be regarded as having a lack of predictability and therefore fall in scope of the draft regulations and an employee can therefore request that predictable working so um, the request in that scenario, when you've got somebody on a fixed term that's under 12 months, um, it's about changing the duration where it would result in a longer fixed term contract or to remove a provision that restricts its duration. So I think that's going to be really interesting to see how um, the use of fixed term contracts are going to be used moving forward. Just remember though, the regulations are still draft as well as the ACAS code of practice and as I said a moment ago, we're just waiting for that consultation feedback to be analysed before any final amendments are made and um, both publications are formalised and published. So in terms of uh, what the regulations uh, require and the ACAS code will support is that all the requests for a predictable working pattern must be handled in a reasonable manner and should be given careful consideration. The draft code advises on an approach based on um, really the statutory right that we have when somebody requests flexible working. So you'll see very similar um, obligations as to when you um, manage flexible working cases. And so what um, the worker will be able to do is make two requests in any 12 month rolling period again and that request must be in writing and include certain information that's prescribed in the code and again if considering rejecting the request then the employer must discuss and consult with that worker before um, refusing it so it is very much similar to your flexible working and i guess ultimately we're going to end up in a in a employment context where our flexible working policies need to be broadened to now include um, the right to request more pred predictable um, working arrangements. The ACAS code talks about um, both the flexible working and a request and a predictable work pattern request and if they make a request for um, a flexible working um, for the purpose of having more predictability in their work pattern it will count as both 
So it'll be one of their two statutory requests for flexible working, um, or it'll be one of their two statutory requests for predictable working. But the um, it still it will still remain the case that only one live request will be allowed at any one time with the same employer, um, whether it's for flexible working or for that predictable working pattern. So as I said, these two pieces of legislation are going to be in operation very closely um, and uh, managed most likely under the one policy. So in terms of communicating the outcome, then all requests must be decided and communicated to the worker within one month. Now, this is different to flexible working. As I've just mentioned a moment ago, flexible working requests, the entire process has to be dealt with in two months. Here, we have a process of uh, that has to be concluded within one month of the date of the request. And again, that includes any appeal. And the code talks about where during that one month decision period, if the worker's contract is due to come to an end, then the obligation is still to continue with that request and see it through. And when it comes to re rejecting any requests for this type of um, arrangement of their hours, then again, it's going to follow how you request under flexible working. So there's those eight statutory reasons that I mentioned a moment ago around you can only reject where there's a burden of additional costs, inability to recruit, reorganize work, or where there's a detrimental impact, et cetera. So those eight statutory reasons I said a moment ago will apply in this um, piece as well. Now, I mentioned um, at the outset of this section that the regulations will apply to employees, those who are with the employment status of worker, so your casual workers, but it will also apply to agency workers. So this is a, as well very interesting. Section B of the draft code of practice specifically applies to agency workers. An agency worker is defined under the agency workers regulations of 2010. The agency worker must have had a contract with the agency at some point in the month before the 26 weeks leading up to the day of the request. And then and an assignment with the hirer, so the business they're going to be doing that work for, an assignment with a hirer for 12 months or less is one type of working pattern that lacks predictability and therefore the worker can make a statutory request similar to like your fixed term contract under 12 months. This means that the worker can make a statutory request to the agency to have an assignment with the same hirer for more than 12 months when they obviously are eligible to doing that. So that's very interesting and a significant development and then when we think about requests to hirers, section B again of the draft code applies to agency workers, again as defined under the agency worker regulations. And the agency worker must have worked in the same role, with the same hirer for 12 continuous weeks within the 26 weeks leading up to the day of the request. So there's a slight difference whether the request is going to the hiring business or whether it, the request has been submitted to the agency that is placing them within the business. So an agency worker can make a request to a hirer for a predictable working pattern for either a contract of employment with the hirer and therefore that will make them a direct employee of the business or they can make a request for um, a working pattern that will give them um, a workers agreement to do work or provide a service personally. What this means is they'll be asking to become a worker of the business so that when we think about employment status, if you remember we have an employee and then we have a worker status, there's quite significant differences with employment rights. But essentially through these regulations, an agency worker to summarise can either request a predictable pattern where they're given a contract and become an employee or an agreement with the hirer where they become a worker of the hirer. A request 
to the business, the hirer must be treated as a request for a contract of agreement in which they do the same or broadly similar work to which they currently do. So I think where it talks about broadly similar, that's obviously going to be an area where it's open to challenge and debate, isn't it? Because it's how do you define broadly similar? And the request must also be for a contract or agreement with terms, conditions, which are overall not less favourable than the usual terms and conditions at the time of the request, or that would be expected when the hirer doesn't have um, any such employees or workers um, in force. So I think this is um, going to be really interesting to um, employers. I think there's going to be a lot of um, thinking about the practical implementation of these regulations and the impact on the business and what steps and actions are going to be needing to take before they come into force. In terms of requests, going back to requests to hirers, the hirer may need to correspond with the agency to clarify information. So that's a given, obviously um, being mindful of all the data protection obligations and things, but there will be a genuine obligation or requirement to correspond. It's vital that any correspondence that goes on between an agency and an employer and the business, it has to occur timely because you've got to remember that you've got that statutory one month decision period. So you are time bound by your decision making and your practices. So you've got to really be prompt um, in terms of your communications. And just to um, clarify that there are no more than two statutory applications during any 12 month period for the agency workers. Um, however, the um, current draft wording in the Code of Practice states a worker can make two statutory requests to the agency and two statutory requests to their hirer in any 12-month period. But only one request can be live at any one time with the agency and at any one time with the hirer. So my reading of that seems to me to suggest that um, you can ultimately potentially have four. <laughs> um, Obviously, these are these codes. Are practice, this code of practice and these regulations are draft, and we're going to um, hopefully see some more firm information and clarity around it. Um, but I just thought I'd highlight that wording that's currently stated in the code of practice. So um, I think with some flexible work changes and with the new laws coming in around individuals being able to ask for more predictability in how they work. Um, I think now is an opportunity to consider how you can draw on flexible working as a, an attraction for candidates and to help you retain staff. Through all our previous webinars when we run polls and things like that or our surveys, we always find that recruitment and uh, retention continue to be challenges for employers. So I just thought that uh, these last few slides before we take your questions will just sort of highlight and uh, talk about how important and beneficial flexible working can be. So not only does it um, encourage a wider talent pool where you can embrace flexible options um, to include those with um, caring responsibilities, those individuals that may have disabilities that perhaps prevent them from uh, doing uh, full-time work but could perhaps do part-time or it opens up the talent pool because it gives you access to people that live further away from the workplace um, as well as those that may be seeking a better work-life balance so it really does give you a wider talent pool which is really vital when you are struggling to recruit. The research that we have consistently also shows there's a link between flexible working and staff retention. Um, employees feel empowered to manage their work around their lives, they're happier and more engaged and ultimately that all results in a lower turnover uh, of staff which ultimately then saves the company time and money on recruitment and training. But also stability breeds trusts. You know employees also crave that stability and predictability and through creating those clear guidelines 
for various flexible working arrangements or consistent core hours, that will really help you to attract and retain. Especially now with, uh, you know, we continue with the cost of living crisis, um, we're seeing more and more people having to take up secondary employment, but even if they're not taking up secondary employment, they're wanting employment that is more secure. So it really is a, a valuable um, attraction tool and retention. But it also enables individuals to better uh, plan. So they have more control over their schedules, they know what hours they'll be working in advance, and therefore it allows them for better planning and reduces that uncertainty that um, otherwise uh, they wouldn't have. And in researching this topic for the webinar, um, I found some interesting information through the CIPD. And they published a report last year, Flexible and Hybrid Working Practices in 2023. And interestingly, it provides an insight from both employer and an employee. So it found that 71% of businesses believed work, flexible working had become more important since the pandemic. And I think the pandemic, you know, uh, with all the uh, challenges that it brought, um, it did highlight how um, businesses can operate more flexibly, um, more remotely, and it's uh, given more opportunity to more people. The report also talks about 60% of businesses are increasing their uptake of flexible working to improve their ability to attract and retain. So we know employers are doing it. We know employers recognize the link between flexible working, attraction and retaining of staff. And actually 83% of those uh, interviewed um, said that they already have hybrid working practices in place. And ultimately 42% of respondents believed that the key benefits to shifting to increased hybrid working was to attract new employees. So there is a lot and lot of research out there that really supports um, the business case for having flexible working arrangements in place. Obviously, the report that I'm talking through is just one, but there are many, many reports out there. And if we think about the employee's perspective, then this report highlighted that 60% of employees have flexible working already in their current role. 71% of employees believe that being able to have a flexible working pattern was important to them. And 53% of employer, employees sorry, report that flexible working, including the remote working, are key when considering a new job. And I think that's an important thing to remember is when you're trying to attract the best talent, you've got to compete against other organisations. And flexible working um, and offering predictable terms, conditions, is a massive factor in somebody's decision making when they're having to choose between if they were to be fortunate and get more than one job offer or even just to um, have an interest in an organisation. And then we talked a lot last year about a four day working week and we have seen a lot of evidence where it's been proven to work for some organisations, but 46% of respondents of these employees from this survey believe that working a four day week would be uh, their preferred arrangement when it comes to flexible working. So obviously the stats do support flexible working, having that predictability of hours, um, you know, and it's just one aspect of your recruitment strategy and your retention strategy, but really they are areas which we really recommend you look to see how you can incorporate it into your own business. So I'm going to um, see if we've had any questions. Um, so Sue, I don't know if we've had many. No, for this one, I think everybody's probably still pondering all the implications of this, and as they're not defined fully yet, yeah. um, I think it's just food for thought. But my feeling is, it's I think it's going to raise a lot of questions about how we present them as policies to our to our staff. Mm. Um, do we have a combined flexible working and predictable terms policy? Do we link the two, have two separate yeah. ones? Do we do we need to indeed look at uh, recruitment and retention in a completely different way and review 
our recruitment um, and em employee retention policies and include it as part of that. So yeah. um, I think I think there's definitely um, a change. Um, yeah. It's a time of change and in these continuing challenging um, times with the recruitment particularly and attracting staff um, to your organization and trying to present your organization in in a in a good light mm. um, then this this is something that um, needs seriously considering um, yeah. obviously we've got the obligations and the process things but it's more the um, from a corporate perspective culture what, um, yes what what are we going to do um, so um, yeah, and we have had a question about how does predictable terms work with zero hours workers? Um, sure. <laughs> and there's been a lot for zero hours workers recently, hasn't there, with the um, holiday pay, etc. So, um, yeah. so essentially, <laughs> they can ultimately put a request in for. Well, yeah, it's like contradictory, it's first, isn't it? Yeah, it is <laughs> conflicting, and I think that's the, that is the challenge. That is why it's quite revolutionary in a way. Because this, this particular one, <laughs> it'll essentially be a part-time contract mm. with regular hours, but most likely. We've argued that for a long time, haven't we? That that yeah. um, when is a zero hours contract to genuine zero hours and it does depend on the drafting of the contract so you can have mm. zero hours agreements that are for genuine casual people very ad hoc work here and there to cover periods of demand yeah. and there's not not likely to be any regularity in that type of agreement but you can have an arrangement with it where they work every week it's just their hours are not defined so it's variable hours as opposed to um, it during the week and and those are the ones that are potentially going to be caught by this and people can say well I actually need to have some predictability of when those hours are going to happen or the days of week I'm going to need to be worked um, but yeah. if they have been working you look at the eligibility requirements they have been working that regular for you then have they indeed become a, a part-time or a genuine variable hours worker that works every week in which case they probably need a different type of contractual arrangement. Yeah, this it's really generated. interesting, isn't it? It is. It's it's generated a few more questions, actually. Um, um, saying about the trial period, if it goes past the two-month mark, is that okay? Well, if we think specific, the flexible working regulations allow you to ex uh, go beyond two months, but um, where agreement has been sought with the individual yeah, isn't it? yeah and it's mm -hmm. got to be a written agreement if you are to go beyond it um, and I would I had to have to check the ACAS code for the uh, other regulations on that but um, yeah it's interesting one month to make that decision um, it's interesting isn't it how they've got different durations it is, and, and I think one month isn't long. And um, uh, the particular terms, it's more contractual, isn't it? And you're looking at the actual situation, the reality. Yeah, true. Um, and, then, yeah. and then deciding how you can best contract with that um, individual. But it, mm -hmm. it isn't long a month. Um, the trial period um, for flexible working is slightly different because that that you can it can exceed because you can have a trial yeah. period for th three or six months so you can agree subject to a trial period and if it doesn't work out and you again you have to have good reason for turning it down at the end of the trial period if it doesn't work out then you're back to um turning down going back either to renegotiate the flexible working or to turning it down on the, mm. one of the genuine reasons so i think it'll be similar um, yeah yeah, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it's about bringing into question what contract you're on ultimately for the predictability yes. regulations. Um, and also employment status. It's going to, people are potentially asking to become um, a worker or an employee, and therefore the impact on employment rights will change. You know, yes. if, they're, if they're an agency worker wanting to become an employee on a contract and um, they would 
automatically then get those employment rights that an employee would receive. Yeah. And, and so it is that, significant. Yeah. There's a subsequent question saying if the zero hours worker is hired by an agency, um, mm. um, will the request need to go by the agency? You can either. If the agency is their employer and they want to, yeah. the request is to um, do more hours with the same employer, isn't it? Um, mm. But the um, request to the hirer can be to take them on. Um, yeah. So, so, that, so therefore, it, it does change. The request is different if you are, if it's going to the hirer and you are an agency worker, mm. than if you are um, a worker mm. for an employer, employer, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mentioned that it's looking like September, possibly October, but sem September roughly is to when they come into force. Um, which isn't long and I think probably you know now is the time to sort of yeah. look at your structure uh, the resource type types of contract that you operate and really sort of carry out a review of your needs moving forward and how you'll be best managing these new pieces well this particular new piece of legislation when it comes into force um, so resource planning is going to be vital over the next few weeks and months and then, like you said, so you decide if you want a standalone policy or to incorporate it as flexible working. The other thing to just flag is um, obviously we're in a year where there is most likely going to be uh, a change, uh, an, a general election. Um, and if there was to be a change, then the Labour Party, for example, are looking to ban zero hour contracts anyway. So going back to that conflict we talked about earlier. Um, mm. It's all interesting, all these potential developments, but that's their standing on that topic. Yeah. So, uh, well, nothing will change if the, if the um, legislation has been passed and it's been brought in, then um, then that will remains. stay until mm. the legislation is changed, and that will take some time to change. Um, but if it hasn't yet been brought in, there is a chance that if there is an election and a new party comes in that they may not bring in anything that's still outstanding or they may interpret it differently. So, yeah, um, yeah I think we're in for some more exciting times <laughs> <laughs> in the yeah. coming um, weeks and months. Um, but, yes, as always, we will um, keep abreast of it. And yeah, um, definitely. Um, so, they, so somebody just asked if the new flexible working arrangements are in place now. Yes, they are. The, yeah. These are in now, 6th of April. They came into effect. I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. So application um, yeah. submitted on or after six of April. Yeah, are under the new legislate legislation. Um, but the predictable terms is the one that's not yet um, yeah. enforced yet. Um, but it's coming. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So yeah. So uh, we've got time to think about it. But I think it is a good time to review your workforce, the workers you use. If you do have peaks and troughs, we're coming into the traditionally the busiest time for seasonal workers um, yeah. other than Christmas and um, you know if you are while, while you can use current legislation at the moment it, it's a good opportunity to reflect on what's working best for you and what will work best for you in the future um, and it could well be that by the time we get to the Christmas peak for um, casual labour and, and zero hours yeah. labour, that we will have the new um, legislation in place. So, um, again, it might be all change. So Yeah, and we, we may revisit this topic as a webinar, perhaps. I think so, um, once we know a bit more. Yeah. Um, so you will all get a copy of the slides, as we said at the start. So um, everything that we've gone through, obviously, are bulleted and summarised on those slide pages, but we'll continue to share updates on um, our socials and our website. Absolutely, that's all, thank you. Oh, then. Okay, lovely, thank you. Really good questions there. So um, just to bring the webinar uh, to a close, just wanted to let you know about our HR knowledge base, which is an online HR resource. Um, so it allows you to do it yourself if you like. So it offers you access to all of our template documents and policies, whether they're letters, forms, checklists, policies, as I said, 
as well as um, hundreds of articles and guides that cover uh, all of these cover the entire life cycle um, and we offer a lot of guidance HR guidance as well um, on a wide range of topics so um, that's our HR knowledge base so do get in touch if you'd like to find out more about that and if anybody is interested in any training um, over the next few months then we offer training as well as you can see from the slide here just to highlight we do ILM levels three and five and most of our training courses ourselves are CPD um, accredited um, so go towards your points um, and we do them in all aspects of managing uh, people We've got a couple of webinars on the schedule. Um, so June next week, next month even, is about prioritising employee well-being, and then in July it's a webinar again linked in with some forthcoming legislation that's due in October. It's all about protecting employees from harassment. So that'd be a key one. And we are actually as well um, currently writing our next webinar schedule. We've got some ideas, but we would also welcome your input. So if you've got any particular topics that you would like us to approach and discuss, either drop it in the comments um, panel now while you're with us on this webinar or drop us a, a separate email afterwards. It'd be great to get your input as well. We've got a few ideas, as I said, and um, but yeah, always welcome your feedback. We also have launched in recent weeks a HR white paper. It's called Strategic HR Thinking and it's about aligning people and business strategy. It's a really insightful document where we explore many, many different topics and areas of uh, strategic HR. Um, so please um, visit our website or um, use the QR code showing here to download your free copy. As I said, it's got some really useful insights in there and how we see the, um, I guess, the world of HR uh, moving forward and how it aligns with um, business strategy as well and how it's fundamental for that. So please do check our white paper out as well. Before we go, we just like to run our normal poll at the end, and it's really just to capture um, your thoughts in terms of if you'd like us to follow up with you after today's webinar on any of our services, whether it's our HR services, training, payroll, the knowledge base that I've just mentioned, or health and safety. So do um, uh, let us know by answering the quick poll, which I think we got that there. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, just close that for you. Brilliant. I just couldn't see it on my screen for some reason then. <laughs> that's that's closed now. That's Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you. And that just um, brings me to the end to say thank you again, as always, for you all uh, attending our webinars um, and for, for taking your time out of your busy schedule. Thank you, Sue, for your support in the questions and uh, the discussion has been really helpful. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody in our next webinar next month. So thank you, everybody.